you thought that these people were just going to leave you alone? I, I don't know where you're at, but we clearly aren't living on the same planet. And of course, what we're talking about here today is the situation out of Illinois that has precipitated itself over the course of the last 24 hours. Uh, if you aren't tracking, they had an assault weapons ban. It was declared unconstitutional, and then that decision was appealed, and now it's been stayed. So it was on, it's off, it was off, and now it's back on again. And the situation is this. We have two decisions that patently uh, ignore the decision of the Supreme Court in Bruin, and one decision, the one that we're talking about in question, uh, that goes along with the constitutional analysis of whether something is uh, allowed as far as regulations as they relate to constitutionality in the Second Amendment. So yeah, this one was always going to happen. It was always going to go to the Supreme Court. And y'all have asked me to uh, dig into it. And I want to look at it from a technical perspective because this one's unique in that I believe that this one is ripe for the reaping, if you will, because the arguments that the Attorney General of Illinois makes in this one are asinine. It's the only way that I can put it. it. They are not based in logical fact. And I believe that when this goes to the Supreme Court, that it's going to get absolutely gutted and it's going to be fantastic. In its motion to delay the implementation of McGlynn's ruling, McGlynn being the district court judge and Raul being the... Uh, the attorney general of Illinois argued that the judge failed to decide whether assault weapons, whatever that means, are bearable arms commonly used for self-defense. Okay, newsflash. AR-15s by themselves, not counting any of the other high-powered weapons that they supposedly uh, claim to be quote-unquote assault weapons, they're currently 23 million <laughs> AR-15s. Slap hands, high five, boys and girls, good work. 23 million AR-15s in the United States. Yeah, I think that's common use. Raul's drag race continued on, stating that McGlynn's ruling failed to meet the burden in Bruin that, banned weapon, that the banned weapons were covered by the plain text of the Second Amendment protecting the rights of plaintiffs to carry firearms for self-defense, as in that the burden is on the people. And actually, that's ass backwards, sir. Uh, the burden is on the government when they go to institute a uh, regulation to prove that it doesn't violate the plain text of the Second Amendment, not the other way around. Nice try, Mr. Legalese Lawyer, but uh, that's not what the Supreme Court said. It's the exact opposite of what they said. Please, please, please try to tell the justices what it is that they meant to say. Ariel's office argued that many of the banned weapons, such as the AR-15 models, have similar capabilities to military-issued firearms and are therefore unnecessary for self-defense in a regular civilian setting. Stop. Stop. This dude is clearly not very well read because use in military units around the world has been used as a criteria to determine whether something is indeed common use. So, literally, if it can be found to be used in a military unit somewhere on the planet, then it is considered as a viable use item for an American citizen just by the nature of the fact that it is, quote-unquote, a weapon of war. The massive amount of energy imparted by AR-15 rounds is far more than needed and counterproductive for self-defense. In fact, assault weapons are inherently dangerous in a home defense scenario because they pose substantial risk to individuals in adjoining rooms, neighboring apartments, or other attached dwelling units. Tell me that you're an attorney without telling me that you're an attorney because this dude definitely failed physics class. You can't have it both ways, buddy. You can either impart a massive amount of energy, as you stated, or you can overpenetrate. You can't do both. You are either dumping energy into the target or you're conserving the energy in the projectile and it will pass through through the properties of kinetic energy. The AR-15 is commonly chambered in 223 or 556 if you want to use semantics. 
but it's usually somewhere around the 55 grain to 62 grain a projectile weight, and it is what is considered a tumble mass projectile, which is actually a technical term that is used in many different game regulation literatures. And it is different from other types of expanding projectiles like hollow points, exposed lead tips, or core lock projectiles uh, in that it, it allows you to produce a more accurate streamlined bullet because you can use a full metal jacket, total metal jacket, or even a fully machined copper projectile that doesn't have the inherent aerodynamic instabilities of those other types of munitions. And how it works is it essentially accelerates the center of mass through the, uh, the vector of the bullet, which is basically the front of the bullet slows down a lot faster than the back of the bullet, and it causes catastrophic breakup of the projectile. If you put it into layman's terms, think about a semi-truck driving down the road, and it gently applies its brakes and slows down over a distance versus if you're driving a 18 wheeler down the road at 75 miles per hour and you just decide that you're going to spin the wheel a couple times to the left that makes a big mess generally speaking we do not see over penetration of these types of munitions because they do jump a substantial proportion of their energy into the target and in doing so fragment the bullet and the laws of entropy take over at that point in time and the fragments just have lower uh, inertia and kinetic energy. It's just the way that the physics work. In fact, you're much more likely to see receive a pass through a target if you're using ball handgun ammunition because those bullets have a similar composition, but they lack the requisite speeds to cause destruction or catastrophic breakup of the jacket is what is typically referred to as that results in expansion of the bullet. And that's why many of the self-defense loadings that you will find in handgun ammunition have some kind of radical hollow point at the front to encourage expansion of that projectile so that it doesn't pass through the target. There's a whole group of silly people out there that try to demonize expanding munitions. And expanding munitions exist for the purpose of making sure that weapon does what we want it to to the person or thing that we want it to, and not to anything else in the vicinity. The AR-15, or the 5.56 round, takes this to the level of perfection in that there is very little chance that if good hits are put on the target of choice, that there's going to be very little collateral damage because, yes, that bullet dumps its energy into the target as intended and is the quintessential home defense weapon because it will minimize that collateral damage. But Kurt, you just made an argument for their energy dump argument. Now nah, hold the phone, boys and girls, because a quick check of the hunting regulations from across the country shows a very different story in that the 223, generally speaking, is considered insufficient for deer hunting, for instance, one of the wimpiest quadrupeds that we generally associate with big game hunting here in the Americas. And just to show you a few, and there are more than just these ones, but these were the easy three that I found. If you look at the game regulations for Colorado, Virginia, and Connecticut, all allow center fire rifle hunting, but place restrictions above the level of 223 caliber ammunition. This is also a thing that you can find in many provinces in Canada, but there's also states like mine that require to use, you to use much more powerful munitions like the 4570. And that said, uh, this is the 223 cartridge, and this is a common deer hunting cartridge. This is the 308. And as you can see, this is a much more sizable round, and I'll show you the data between these two munitions. This is Fioku 223A and 55 grain projectile, and this one is uh, 308A from Fioki. So we have the data for those, and you can see that the 308 is considerably more powerful. So what I'm getting at is that there is no quantifiable metric that you can use to determine that this 223 cartridge is a powerful cartridge. In fact, I would classify this as a weak center fire cartridge. In fact, its official designation is an intermediate cartridge. This is a full power rifle cartridge. There are magnum rifle cartridges. This is an intermediate rifle cartridge. By definition is a weak projectile or a weak cartridge, a weak loading. 
in all manner and senses of the words. So it is at this time that I would first like to issue a thank you to the Attorney General of Illinois for making this possible, and then also for rendering what has to be some of the most asinine arguments that I have ever heard for uh, the types of things that they are trying to implement. And I look forward to seeing how this gets shredded at the next level, because if they have anybody who has any semblance of firearms subject matter expertise, there is no way that the arguments that have been made in this, uh, in this plea, because <laughs> that's really what it is, it's l- literally grasping at straws here, can be considered factually accurate. And I think that it will crash and burn in a spectacular fashion. So thank you for joining us here today on the VSO Gun Channel. And I would like to know what you think in the comment section down below. I'm Curtis, and I had a great time making today's video, and hopefully we'll see you on another one.